Good morning, good morning, Niner fans. Dion here, your 49er reporter. I'm um, just going to get the particulars out of the way. This is a video about the 49ers versus the Panthers. First off, if you like it, hit that like button. If you want to subscribe, hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification bell so I can keep you up to date on any and everything all 49ers. And with that being said, I'm going to give it to you straight, no chaser. So let's get right into it. So we are facing the Carolina Panthers. This is probably our biggest test this season. Um, they are 4-2, and two, and they seem to have the ball rolling. You know what I'm saying? CMC out there doing big things in the run game, in the pass game. He's not too bad of a blocker. Um, there's been an a emergence of Kyle Allen, their quarterback, um, while Cam Newton has been uh, trying to recover from his injuries. Their defense is actually playing very, very solid. So there's a couple things we need to take heed to in this game. We're going to get right on into them, all right? So let's start off with the elephant in the room, CMC. So uh, Christian McCaffrey, um, you know, they have the ninth-ranked rushing attack, mostly due to Christian McCaffrey. Um, so this is kind of how his games have gone throughout the year. Versus the Rams, 128 yards, two TDs. Versus the Bucks, 37 yards. No touchdowns versus the Cardinals, 153 yards, one TD. Texans, 93 yards, TD. Jags, 176 yards, touchdown, uh, two touchdowns. And then versus the Bucks, 33 yards and one touchdown. If y'all paid attention to what I said, versus the Bucks twice, they have a blueprint of how to stop him. Now, in one game, they didn't stop him from getting into the end zone, but there's a blueprint on how to slow him down. So, basically, if we watch what the Bucks did, that can help our game plan and how to slow him down and how to stop him, you know what I'm saying, or how to limit him in some way to the yardage that he normally gets, you know, because other than that, he's been running all over the NFL. Um, now, they have the 20th ranked offense all together, uh, 22nd ranked passing attack with Kyle Allen as their quarterback. Um, <clears throat> so, he's had... 261 yards versus the Cardinals and four TDs, but it was the Cardinals early in the season and the defense was it's shit. Um, he had 232 yards versus the Texans, no touchdowns, but he did have three fumbles. And he had 181 yards in the TD versus the Jags, but he fumbled again. And then he had 227 yards and two TDs versus the Bucks. So he's only played four games. He's won all four of his games because Cam Newton started the season uh, to have them 0-2. But he has been sacked 10 times. Um, you know, none of their receivers pose a very big threat. I mean, you still got to respect Greg Olson because he is still a viable tight end. We get that. Um, you know, now, one thing I will say is their defense is solid. Their defense is very, very, very solid. So they have the 12th ranked defense, the 7th against the pass. And that's not bad because being in the top 10 against the pass means you don't allow much going on, on you know, in that field. But they are 23rd against the rush. And we, however, happen to be a great rushing team. We are number two in the league when it comes to running the ball. So that gives us an opening to be able to come and gash them with our run game. Because, you know, we run that stress zone type of uh, type of uh, scheme with Kyle Shanahan. And believe you me, we're going to get our yards. You know, uh, Matt Breida going to be out there getting his yards. Tevin Coleman going to get his yards. Most will get his yards. Jeff Wilson Jr. will get his yards. You know, um, it hurts right now because we're still missing juice, you know. But right now, Ross Dwelly is filling it admirably for it. Um, they are trying to see if Joe Staley can go in this game only because they've got some pretty good edge rushers. So for the Carolina defense, you got this kid Brian Burns, four and a half sacks. Gerald McCoy, you all know who he is. He's a longtime buck. Um, he has two and a half sacks. Uh, Mario Addison, six and a half sacks. Luke Keeley, Luke Keekley, you always got to pay attention to Luke Keekley. He's a sure tackler. He does not miss tackles, and he is the heart and soul of that defense. And for years and years, he's been a pro bowler, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. Um, now, in their defensive secondary, this kid Bradbury's got three interceptions. Uh, this kid Cockrell got two interceptions. Um, Dante Jackson's got two interceptions. If you remember who Dante Jackson is, he lost the keys in that race for that million dollars. Um, 
<clears throat> so he's 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 quick. You know what I'm saying? That means that we don't have very many receivers that are like super fast, but we know Keith can burn him because he'll edge him out at a bare minimum. Um, so the next thing is is their 12th ranked defense overall. Like I said, seventh against the pass, 23rd against the rush. So basically, we run the ball first and pass the ball second. So we can go ahead and attack them the same way we've been attacking other teams. Shanahan will scheme something up that you know will be able to combat what they do on defense and how sure you know of tacklers they are. Now I understand still that we are still playing with a school and front school as our bookend tackles, and they have been playing very admirably. And personally, I say don't rush Joe Staley back. Don't rush Mike McGlinchey back. McGlinchey wasn't playing too great uh, that's this season, but at the same time with Staley, let him heal up properly. I say at a bare minimum, if you want to try to get him back starting for the Cardinals game. You know, I watched Kyle Shanahan's postgame, you know, uh, his presser, and he basically was uh, stating that he wanted to get them back as quick as he possibly could because you don't want to have guys like that out when you're trying to make a playoff push. And I get it. But the thing is, is if we can beat Carolina, Without Joe Staley and without Mike McGlinchey, we're going to play the Cardinals. Now, don't get me wrong. The Cardinals have had our numbers for the past couple of years. They truthfully have. Josh Rosen beat us a couple times last year. I have no idea how that worked out. But what I will tell you is, it's very simple. I don't understand how we would need to waste re-injuring Joe Staley on, you know, the Cardinals. Their defense isn't as solid as it's been this year. Um, you know, I mean, the person you really got to be worried about, honestly, is just Chandler Jones. Uh, Patrick Peterson is back from his game, his his suspension. And, yeah, they are they, they are rolling. You know, Cliff Kingsbury got them winning a few games. You know what I'm saying? So our division is very competitive. But I say Justice School and Daniel Brunt School will do the job, and we will be perfectly fine. <laughs> so for us, we have picked up a receiver. We picked up Emmanuel Sanders. I know I... I, you know, dropped that breaking news video on that. So we got Emmanuel Sanders in the fifth round pick. We gave up a third and a fourth round pick. And I can tell you this. Initially, when I heard about the trade, it shocked me. And then I was kind of a little iffy on it. And the only reason I'm iffy on it is because I'm trying to figure out how Jimmy G and Emmanuel Sanders are going to create some, so much chemistry in such a short span of time. We're already 6-0, so I know this is a good thing for Sanders because he went from a losing team to a winning team. And I know he already loves the culture by watching, you know, his uh, interviews that he's had. Um, he was definitely a fan of Shanahan wearing some Yeezys. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that that's cool and all, but quarterbacks and receivers have to build chemistry. So I, from what I've heard, Jimmy has been going in and he has been taking the time to go ahead and, and build that chemistry with Emmanuel Sanders and do what he needs to do. The one thing that I will say is that Sanders does bring veteran leadership to the squad. You know he's a, he's a Super Bowl winner. He's been in the, he's been in the playoffs several times when he came to being with the Steelers and with the Broncos, and he seems to have recovered well from the injury. So what I would say is is we gave up a lot of capital for him, and Sanders in his interview straight up said maybe one to two years or three years left of football. So then what I'm figuring is if we gave up that kind of capital for him. We'll sign him probably to a little two-year extension, and he'll come cheap. You know, we won't have to pay him, like, super big bucks, We so so we don't have to wind up sacrificing uh, keeping Defoe or, or keeping George Kittle because those are the guys that we need to sign. And if Armstead keeps playing the way that he's playing, one of two things are going to happen. They're either going to let him walk or they're going to pay him, and I think they're going to let him walk. And the only reason I say that, guys, and I know we wouldn't want to let him go because I don't want to let him go, especially not with the level that he's playing at, is because – they know that Defoe is going to be more, uh, you know, he, he's, a, he's a better player. And at the same time, they know they're not going to be able to pay him and Armstead because Armstead is not going to want a discount. He's going to know that there's money out there and available for him, so he's going to want to take advantage of it. And I can understand that, man. You know, when you're in the NFL, you got a short time to be able to get that bread. So you got to get that good contract. you got to get that contract with the guaranteed money and everything like that. So I respect him. You know what I'm saying? I respect Arce. I respect what he's been doing. You know what I'm saying? He's been doing a celebration where he's been eating quarterbacks and he's been recovering fumbles. And, I mean, basically our line is, is D4, Nick Bosa on the edge, and Armstead and Buckner in the middle. And that's been a formula for nothing but success. So 
the beauty of this is is that you know with those types of situations you want to be in those situations because we're basically rotating guys in and out and we, we're not losing a step we're continually putting pressure on the quarterback and we're only rushing four you know so then when we do decide to send Quan or fred or we decide to send Quan and fred the quarterback is freaking out because he doesn't have any time to make a decision. You can't go through your reads if you are D Ford already in the backfield. The sack that he had on Case Keenum last week, I don't know what he does or how he does it, but literally when the ball was snapped, he was in the backfield. And that's, that's a ridiculous get off. Um, so, I mean, it's it's just a, a serious thing. And then for Emmanuel Sanders, this, these are just his stats. You know what I'm saying? So, He's caught 30 out of 44 passes that were thrown his way. He has 367 yards, two TDs. He's got 12.2 yards for a catch, no no fumbles, no drops. The only person that has more yards on our team than him is George Kittle. He's doubled the amount of uh, yards that any of the other receivers on our team have. And he's doubled their touchdowns because uh, most of them have one. Um, you know what I'm saying? So that that's that's ridiculous stuff. On a good note, though, one thing I did hear yesterday when I was going ahead and taking a look at some things and reading on just some transactions, Kyle Nelson, our long snapper, is back from suspension. Thank God. And you know why I say thank God? Because that may be a situation where it'll start to, you know, go ahead and get the chemistry back when it comes to Robbie and Mitch and, you know, them kicking field goals and everything like that and uh, kicking extra points because Robbie has been horrendous this season. But it's unfortunate because we've been going through long snappers like left and right. But when you have a long snapper that knows what you do, he knows the snap count, he knows how to put the ball to you, get it to you where you need to be, then you don't have to worry about that. Some people don't believe a long snapper is a very vital part of you know any type of offense. But as far as a special teams, yeah, you need a good long snapper because he's going to get Mitch the ball correctly. And he's going to go ahead and get, you know, get Mitch the ball to be able to place it properly for Robbie to kick these field goals. Um, last game, he won us the game because he kicked off, you know, all three of those field goals and we, you know, we were good. Another thing that I did read too, Jimmy G has 132.6 passer rating on all play actions from our 21 personnel that we run. And we run that a lot. Um so that basically says, you know, anytime we continually run a ball, run a ball, run a ball, set up that play action, Jimmy's bound to make a good throw and a great throw. Now, one thing I can say, uh, you know what I'm saying, as far as even just looking at everything is, is that Jimmy hasn't played fantastic this season, but he's done what he's needed to in those moments. You know what I mean? Whenever we're down, you know, he finds a way to be able to make everything work and, I understand that everybody's looking for a spectacular quarterback play of three or 400 yards and four touchdowns or three touchdowns. And, you know, possibly one, you know, one of these games, we want him to pull Aaron Rodgers and throw six touchdowns. Jimmy is still learning. He literally just put a full season of being a quarterback under his belt. So we have to continue to give him time to develop. Now, if he makes it through this season we can make it, you know, to the playoffs and make a deep run and or make the Super Bowl and possibly win it, then we can start to put a little more pressure on him that the next season coming in, he's got to grow and he's got to continue to grow and be better. Um, the 49er offense is seventh in total offense, number two in rushing. Now, the place where we suck, honestly, is 25th in passing. So I can understand how fans and, and other people um, and even commentators and, and you know other media can get – a little upset because yeah 25th and passing that's it's not good for a starting quarterback but we run the ball primarily that is what we do we have so many different ways to run the ball our zone stretch scheme is what works so we're not going to veer away from that because we got Emmanuel Sanders now does that state that we can't throw the ball a little bit more yes we can but at the same time I've been hearing as well they might move somebody you know, I'm hearing that Dante Chettis, Dante Pettis is possibly a, a chess piece that we can move, you know, and get out of there to be able to get at least that fourth rounder back. And am I sad about that? Not really. The guy just hasn't played up. To, you know, he hasn't been up to snuff. We wasted a second round pick on this dude and he has been nowhere to be found all season except for one touchdown in the game. You know, what I'm saying to help us win it. Now, do I appreciate that? Yes. But other than that, Pettis ain't been nowhere, you know. 
the pass that was intercepted as far as what Jimmy G was doing, that wasn't on Dante. And I know a lot of people feel like it is, but it wasn't on Dante. The one thing I will tell you is that that was on Jimmy. Jimmy didn't place the ball properly. He did not look off the safety properly. And at the end of the day, he would have needed to put that ball a little bit further so that the safety couldn't read it and make a play on it. Um, you know, defense, we're number one against the pass. We're seventh against the rush. And we have the number two overall defense in the league. Armstead has three and a half sacks. Solly's got two. Defoe's got three and two forced fumbles. Nick's got four. Uh, Ronald Blair's got two. D Ford has four and a half sacks and two forced fumbles because he's very good with that chop. He comes through and chop the arm off a quarterback if he can uh, to be able to force fumbles. And then, of course, on uh, on defense, Sherm's got two picks with six passes defense, and Kwan's got two interceptions. He's got that one on the goal line. I uh, can't remember from which game, and then he's got that other one that he had. I think it was against uh, it was against either the Bucks or someone else that we played. But either way, um, you know what I'm saying? Personally, I'm going to say we win this game probably like 24 to 10, 24 to 13. Um, and there's a high probability, guys, that this could be a low-scoring game because the defenses are so good. You know, we might have a situation on our hands possibly where we wind up with another 9 or nine to nothing win. You know what I'm saying? Because the defenses are playing very solid. But we're in Santa Clara. We're in the home of the faithful. You know what I'm saying? So... We are the night of gang, and we're going to show up and we're going to show out. Now, what I will tell you is I'm going to address the elephant in the room. I had a video a while back. It's my most viewed video on this channel of why we shouldn't draft Nick Bosa. And I was very, very upset, you know what I'm saying? And I said what I said, and at that time, I meant what I said. Have my views changed on Nick Bosa? Yes, they have because the players have accepted them. And, you know, they say nothing but good things about him and how good of a person he is in the locker room and all of that. One thing I will tell you guys, though, is don't think that these dudes didn't press him about his situation behind closed doors. They're not going to put that out to the media and tell the media, oh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? We checked him about that because you're going to keep that in-house. You're not going to say nothing about that. But you really think that Uncle Sherm going to be in there and not say something to that man about what he did a long time ago? And, yes, he was a kid. But the one thing that I'm going to tell y'all, and I know some people may be uncomfortable with this, but I feel like that was a classic case of white privilege, period, point blank. It was a situation where Nick Bosa said some very, very things, some, some very, very uncomfortable things that would make you think, how is he in the locker room with all these African-American men, these black men, and saying these things and liking these things and all this stuff? And then the media is like, oh, well, you know, he was a kid, you know, just give, give him a break, cut him some slack, blah, blah, blah. But then if somebody else would have done something like that, if that had been somebody black, you'd crucify him. You know what I'm saying? If you had somebody doing something, you know, negative, you put it out there real quick. Look at all the things that these people do out here in the media, and, and they put it out fast. But look at all the things that have happened, unfortunately, with white players over the years. They've been swept under the rug. Look at what happened with that kicker over with the New York Giants. Magically, he still had a job, and he was at home beating his wife. Are you serious right now? So my thing is, it, but the, look, the Marcus Lawrence and 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 uh, uh, the dude that went from the the Cowboys to now fighting in MMA, um, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people out there that's been black that have been put on blast for the things they did, but for some reason somehow the situation with Nick at the time was swept under the rug. So I felt it necessary for me, uh, you know, trying to break into being a media personality to address that, you know, and, and say what I had to say. And the thing is, is I can say what I have to say and not sugarcoat nothing because this is my channel and this is what I have to do. Now, if I was ever to get into the real media, could I say things the way that I said it? No, I'd have to be extremely tactful in my approach to it, but I would still be upset regardless. Now, like I said, has my view of him changed? Yes. Am I accepting of him being on the squad? Yes. But one thing I will not forget, one thing I will not say is, is at that time, I was not going to back off of my position, and I still will not back off of my position from what I said because at that time, that's how I felt, and this is a world where you can change your mind, so if people want to try to hold me to how I felt previously, you have fun with that. I truthfully do not care. One thing I will tell you is, is obviously he's made a change. Obviously, he's been talked to about the things that have happened, and all the people in the locker room respect him, so I accept him as well, and I can change my mind on how I feel. I don't have to keep that same energy and all that other stuff. I don't have to do nothing because I don't come from that era. I come from the 80s where you can change your mind and you can think for yourself and think freely. You know what I'm saying? I got thicker skin than most, but 
One thing I will say is I still love my Niners. I love what he's doing on the field. He's done a fantastic job as a, you know, as our defensive end. We're going to win this game 24 to 10. I'm going to give that as my final score. Y'all stay blessed. Y'all stay not and faithful and have a good day.